Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, uh, here, I'm just trying to figure out my audience. So we got uh, sales of, of this product. How many people sell this product? So, okay, okay. How about the end users? How many end users here? Okay. Uh, what are the rest of you here for? <laughs> just kind of go, check, check, out the, check out the technology. Oh, for, for the food, for the coffee? Okay, all right. <laughs> Yeah, 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 sure, sure. <laughs> That's who I am. Um, I originally came on with Step Energy Services six years ago as the maintenance manager and uh, now hold the title of reliability specialist. Uh, one other person here, Dave Osmond down here, was a reliability specialist as well for Step um, and a maintenance manager, and he was over in the fracturing division. I actually support now, because of the size of the company, it's a thousand uh, um, employees that uh, I focus on coil tubing and fluid pumping, and that's where I spend most of my time. So I look at things of, of financial risk, uh, safety risk, or the combination of both of those. So that's where my focus will go. So in, here I just want to talk over who we are. Uh, so some of you don't know what coil tubing is. I'll show you a couple pieces of slides for that. The mindset that I use in regards to maintenance. So I'm not going to give. You, I'm not going to sell you a new technology here at all. I'm just, it's a mindset that we use. It changes everything that we do and how much money we make. What changes came out of that mindset and what are our returns? And I'll, I'll give you a couple of uh, true examples of money that we've saved to, from this mindset. I'm not here to sell you a one eye industries product. Uh, we use it, but again, it's, it's about Step Energy Services. Um, we service uh, oil and gas wells throughout uh, Western Canada and Texas, Louisiana, probably going to go to North Dakota and uh, down through the states. Um, again, we only started uh, six years ago. We we're 1,000 employees just last month. We also became an, uh, a publicly traded company as about four months ago, five months ago. So, In fact, our, our shares today are the highest they've ever been uh, at $10.11. I'm not going to retire just yet. Um, and we prospered in times when everything went down for the last three years. We were competing against companies that uh, were losing about 7% EBITDA um, on their bottom line, and we were doing exactly what they were doing with the same amount of equipment. We had 7% plus. So there's a 14% differential between some of those companies. So that's a coil tubing unit. Um, there's a trailer cab reel. We are, that reel there, that coil tubing that's here, is rolled up and then straightened, put into the well. This device up here is an injector. This reel here would cost around $250,000 for the tubing that's on that. If you damage it, you're done. You take that and throw it away and start again. If that thing up here breaks, you're going to pay for everything on lease. And it could range in, into the millions and has on several occasions. Not for us, but when our company worked for, I won't mention it was Tricam. <laughs> uh, nitrogen pumper basically takes liquid nitrogen makes it into a vapor, uses it for blowing the, the tubing out, down, down holes and inert, safe, pretty safe uh, gas. Uh, here's a twin pumper. Um, this, we have uh, 24 of these now. We started, uh, we originally ordered six. Um, you might notice if you're really keen, you might see a couple of Advantage 9000 sitting right there. I had to argue to get those on, on the very first one. Um, it was about uh, eight months later, the same company was building a twin pumper for our competition, and guess what was on the back? Advantage 9000s. So I asked them, I said, how come I had to argue and pay $8,500 for each set that was put on there, and these guys drove away with it? Oh, we mistakenly gave them your bill of materials. Yeah. No, I found out later they actually went in and asked for our bill of materials. Yeah. This is the frack spread. These, this is actually uh, all of those items there were actually purchased from gas frack for uh, less than 10 cents on the dollar when they went bankrupt. So a blender and an iron truck and a, and a frack pumper, the evil frack pumper on the bottom. That uh, Dave would have been responsible for all that equipment. So the, what mindset does Step use in regards to maintenance? Maintenance is maintenance, right? It just just fix the stupid thing and keep it going, right? Um, we're an owner operator. Think of that. Um, just like you are owner operator of that human body. And it's your responsibility to maintain it, right? So you don't want to spend any more on it. You want it to do what you want it to do. We're the same thing with equipment. We're the owner operator. We don't want to spend any more money than we have to. So that's one of the key things here. We want to spend as little as possible comparative to our competition. We just want to wipe the nose and that's it, send it back to work, right? 
Second point, we want the equipment to work harder and produce than the same equipment that our competition uses. So if I'm in competition with you building bread, and we have the same machine, and I build one more loaf than you every day, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, absolutely, the same product, right? And that's kind of what's happening here with this product as well. And at the bottom, we want the, the equipment to be reliable. There's that, that word again. Coming out of the other two, that's what's going to happen. So what changes? What, what are you going to have to change? Well, we're going to have to do predictive maintenance. Anybody know what predictive maintenance is? Anybody tell me what that is? Anybody? What is predictive maintenance? You predict, I mean, from the word, yeah. you, you anticipate, you know, that something's going to go wrong, so you fix it before it gets. So I have to measure. I have to measure. So checking the oil on the dipstick is a measurement, right? So we're going to have to do predictive maintenance on this. The reason I ask on, on that, you can talk to many, many professionals throughout the industry, and it's predictive, preventative, preventive, and a, a bunch of other maintenance topics, and they'll give you all kinds of different examples of what that is. But predictive is, is the measurement. Absolutely, you're correct. This one, I don't know if you've ever seen it, it's called the P to F factor, or, or, or chart. So the potential at the far end here is everything working well, maintained. But the potential of having a problem is right there on that red line. When they meet and get to here, we're going to have a failure. So that illustration would be that Dodge pickup truck. Hopefully nobody drives Dodges here. That you got out in the deer foot and the, tire, the, the steering wheel just shook a little bit and then the right front tire exploded off the right side of that truck, ripped out the inner fender line, ripped up the fender a bit and you came to a stop on the side of the road and the guys that you were just driving with on the deer foot are now trying to run you over. You thought they were their friends, but they're not. <laughs> the potential of have knows that you had a problem. Where was the potential? What evidence did you have? The shaking of the wheel, right. The, the failure happened seconds after that. Wouldn't you want that spread that out a little bit? And we would want it to back it up. So if you actually did that walk around in that truck and noticed the tire was a little bit flat, the potential was still there but just spread it out, right? So we want to back it up, back it up, back it up. And that's for our predictiveness. That's what we, we, we focus on. I could give a whole seminar just on that, that part. Um, we take ownership of the maintenance of our equipment. One guy uh, worked for us down in the United States and, uh, as a maintenance manager, and he really wasn't a great maintenance uh, manager. And uh, so they, they released him, but he's a great technician. And uh, we keep in contact today. And he said, the one thing that I've learned from you is never to trust the OEMs. I'm sorry, sorry Cecil, that's, that's the truth of it. We have a good working relationship for sure. Out of this, your maintenance staff are going to acquire different training. If I had a, a, a coil tubing unit, who am I going to hire to maintain this? Any idea? In Canada, what are we, what are we going to call them? Are we going to, is it a TV repair guy? What is it? What is the trade that we're going to hire to work on this? in Canada. Nobody's ever hired a heavy duty mechanic? That's what we call them. Or a millwright, right? In, in the United States it's really difficult because they don't have an apprenticeship program, right? But in Canada, we, so when we hire that millwright or that heavy duty mechanic, his job is to return it to the way it was so it continued to function. His, we congratulate them on the fact that they can ch change out that broken part faster than they did last time but nobody's in, into the root cause. If 80% of my failures are lubrication focused, why doesn't that millwright have certification from the International Council of Maintenance and Lubrication? We have two in the company, myself and one of the guys taking a course today, but yet we have 30 or 40 mechanics. How come they all don't have that? When 80% of the problem they're gonna have is related to maintenance and lubrication. You see where I see the focus? The, this is the one we struggle with the most. But Dave and Frack, he might have been working for a different company. The management, upper management, is not focused here. They don't support this as much as coil and tubing did. Now you go into a whole seminar on why. And you need the right tools. That sometimes it's just physical tools. If you, here, uh, I could ask in quite a few of these guys, the oil I get in the Petrocan drum, is it clean or dirty? 
It's dirty. Everybody knows that. Now we do. So I have to filter before I put it in. So why doesn't the shop have a filter cart or a dispensing with filtration on it? They don't. Most of them don't. They still free pour the oil into the top of the engine. What well, is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life? So, and we're going to have to modify some of this equipment. So we're going to take ownership, do a predictive mate, and we're going to modify. Uh, Roger, I think these are from an N2 unit, are they not? Just recently, NOB put them on, took them out, took a bunch of pictures of them. I think it's in a video somewhere. So we're going to have to modify some of this equipment. And we're going to put sight glasses in, pressure gauges, test ports, some flow gauges. Remember the old flow that used to, some of the older people remember when you filled your, your vehicle up with fuel, the little ball would roll around on the side of the, Right, so we got a, a circuit that's got low pressure. Why don't you put a wheel on a little flow? CBBL, we bought a couple of those and put them in. So our operations, they just come over and look. Oh, there's a little wheels going around. In fact, I was going to put a little smiley face on there, <laughs> have them something to look at. Um, a magnetic filtration and remote monitoring. Didn't I say predictive maintenance was measuring? How come magnetic filtration is on there? You can measure what you capture and get a sample of it. Absolutely can. And so it's not just pulling it out, I can actually look at it. I've talked to Roger about this, is I want this daylighted. I want this made of plexiglass on this low pressure circuit. So I can just go up and look at it. Make it easy for myself anyway. Um, lack of trusting the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, throw the manual away. Throw the manual that they gave you away. We can, who made it? Who wrote it? Some, probably some engineer that took a bunch of information, put it together, and he was sitting at the table. He's not running that piece of equipment out there in Grand Prairie, right? So what are the returns on this? You think I made any money on this? This is actually a true one. Um, I just, this is a gearbox. This is Eaton 1202 gearbox. It's got 7590 oil in it, um, Petrocan oil, some of the best oil, I think, that's in the market. Um, if you took it the way it is right there, the math works out to $52,000 per year, um, or over six years, and $5.87 per operating hour. So I'm competing against this. This here, this number here, actually it's step, same, same unit is $2.04 per operating hour for step. I can actually show you those numbers. That's on every box. We have 24 of those. So when it comes down to price and put money in your pocket, why did I get there? What, what made the difference for this? On this gearbox, what, what did we do? I did some filtration. Because when they started this gearbox up, they have 800 horse going in here on a Cat 318 engine. 800 horse going in there with five liters of oil, what's going to happen to the oil? It's going to get hot. The ODM put in a cooler. But they can't, the oil is just not going to go through the cooler. It's got to have a pump. So they put a pump on the end. Right behind the bracket there, there's a pump. So when the gearbox is in, in gear, that pump is flowing oil. I'm a hydraulic specialist. What do I need for my pump? Filter. Did they put one on? No. Not a chance. Why? Possibility. Slow down flow. Huh? It'll plug off and slow down flow and start the flow. Yeah, could be, but their main reason they didn't put on it. Money, right? It would, why, do they, why do they make the twin pumper? Why does Servo make that twin pumper? Make the world better? No, they're making profit. They want to make money. Absolutely. But I want to buy it, and what do I want to do with it? I don't want to spend money on it. That's, that's what it is with every piece of equipment I got. In fact, I got an email from my boss saying, uh, can you settle down on the email back to this other company? They think you're adversarial. And he wrote back, no shit. Because <laughs> I am. It, 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 it's an adversarial relationship, but we know that going in, right? So we've talked to several companies in regards to um, making that twin pump because they say, well, we can't put the best filters on. We can't put the better pump on. We can't put magnetic filtration on. You can if, you, if I pay for it. Absolutely. Why aren't you offering it to me? So the, the Cecils, the CSI, and Wranglers, they adopt that technology. Isn't it less expensive for you for them to put it on when it's built rather than for you to modify it when you get it? 40 to 1. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And 
again, what, what do I employ? I, I employ, we actually change their names from mechanics to maintenance professionals. That's their job is to maintain this equipment. They're not installers, they're not modifiers, they're not assemblers, they're maintainers, right? So as soon as you take that thing out and, you, and, and have to start putting this stuff in, yeah, it costs you a lot more money. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we got there, we put in the, the sight glass, the test ports, the depth media filtration, magnetic filtration, and, and a pressure gauge. And this turned into a flow gauge because when we went back to operations, they said, well, it's 60 PSI, is that good? And now we can just put a little sign on it. If this wheel is turning, it's good. If it's not, call somebody, right? And so this application here, um, with the test port, one of the things we do is obviously test the oil. Um, when uh, I got the, the results back on the oil of a gearbox now, like a differential in a car, what's the main part particle that's going to be in that oil, do you think, after running it for a little while? What's going to be in there? Metal filings. In fact, the oil actually turns actually black. There's oxidization going on for sure, but it's actually black. It's black with metal, so it better have a magnetic filter on it for sure. Um, when we started with the frac department, a gentleman by the name of Mike Burville came over from Trican, and we called him Mr. Trican because I think he still has a tattoo. It might hurt to have it taken off. And he, he walked up to me and he said, because he's going to run the frac department, he'd just been visiting the coil department where these units are parked. And he said, Dale, I was overlooking a twin pump. Did you guys just change all the oil out? I said, no, Mike. That's the oil that was in it from original. That unit there has around 25,000 hours on it. Six years of operations right there. And the oil's never been changed. So we test it. That oil that's in that gearbox is cleaner than the petrocan bucket you're bringing to it. And that's a gearbox, right? And we got it through the application of what? Magnetic filtration, depth media filtration, and then testing to, to get it there. So the returns on, 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 our, on our maintenance is less cost to maintain. It produces more. It's more reliable and it's safer. And that's what actually drives me, is the safer part. In 2014, we killed 37 workers in Alberta in the oil and gas industry. The greater portion of those were killed doing one thing and one thing only. What was that? The majority of those workers in Alberta, in oil and gas, were killed doing one thing. Any idea? Driving. They were, they were killed driving. Whether they rolled the big rig hard. And I used to carry around a picture of Wayjax's service truck, an F450, folded in half. It was folded in half on 52nd Street and 76th in the foothills. The driver made a left-hand turn in front of a loaded gravel truck and it folded that truck around the front of that bumper. The passenger that he had had gotten out 15 minutes earlier. And the reason I carried their picture around because we didn't have one. We hadn't crashed a truck. Unfortunately, I can't say that today. We rode off a top kick. It's a little bit bigger than an F550 or 450. Rode it off. And when I talked to the driver, he said, well, the guy was speeding. I said, honestly? So you pulled out in front of him and said, I think I'll slow him down. He pushed that F-150, the firewall, that's where the front of the truck was. Seriously injured the driver. I said, Jared, he still works for us today. I said, Jared, I'm going to give you an, an excuse here. I really am, because I'm going to tell you, you were not driving that truck. No, I was. No, you weren't. This wasn't in the truck. This was at the least going to the problem you were going to fix. That's where your brain was. He said, absolutely. I was thinking about the cylinder that had failed that I have to rush out and, and change out. So can we look at that part that's on that unit that's failed and say, is it not directly responsible to the mindset of the guy in the truck and why he's there in the first place? I do. I, my, I make the total click connection. Right? I had an air valve shifting a, a, a gearbox. It's worth $1,000. Namco sells them to us. Well, they used to. 
We, when I went up to Fort St. John, there was two in every service truck, brand new of these in a box. I said, what, what's going on here? Why do you have this cylinder? Oh, they fail all the time. Oh, you want to get my ire up? Tell me that. Tell me that you got a brand new part in the truck because you're a repair technician. You're the rescue. You might as well put lights and sirens on your service truck for crying out loud. You're the hero. You're going to go race out there. That cylinder was costing us $42,000 a failure. Because the rig is built out at $70,000 per day, and it's down when that cylinder doesn't work. It's down. It's a critical item. So they were carrying the ones around. We solved it. We solved the problem. We took the cylinder, and I'm not an expert on cylinders. I took them to the cylinder manufacturer, and I took them to a machine shop. And I said, tell me what you think the root cause is this. And the, the cylinder was made of brass. He said, you can't make it out of brass. Well, I don't know. They, Namco's the experts. They built them. So you can't make it out of brass. It's too rough. It'll wear the, the O-ring right off. Neat idea. This, the um, seal manufacturer said the piston's made wrong. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, the, the seal is an X-seal. And it's supposed to kind of roll over like your wiper on your window. But he said, they didn't make the gap wide enough to allow it to rock. Really? We make those in a box to replace them. I make six of them in Calgary, assembled for $1,000. Not one, six. And these ones, you know what our fail rate is now? For that, for that mechanism. I'm sure we'll find another mechanism to wreck it with. But our guys were racing around to be the hero. And guess what we were paying them to do it? Great job. Here's your overtime check. I would love to have HR change the way we pay our, our technicians. How should we pay them? Our maintenance professionals should be paid totally different, shouldn't they? Should be paid on uptime, not downtime. Right? Should be totally different. They won't let me do it. We're too ingrained into the industry that we have. Does the, does, um, the apprenticeship program have to change? Absolutely. They need to have maintenance caregivers. They need to have a course for that. I went and spoke in front of the HET, which is a heavy equipment transport technician course in Red Deer. It was their graduating day, and there was about 30 in, in a room. And I gave a spiel on reliability. And the, um, one of the guys up front had a question. He said, how do I get this course? And he said, it's not available. There's nothing in mobile, absolutely nothing. And the, the instructors, there were six of them sitting back there, looking just like Steve was, like that. Did they call me back? No. No, sir. Why? Because Cat, Cummins, John Deere, they're all contributing to the apprenticeship program with parts and equipment. Do they want me in there? Nope. Nope, not at all. I, I don't, uh, per se, have any more slides, but I, I have a lot I can talk to in, in, in regards to this. I probably have a little bit of time. No, yeah, you got it. Okay. Yes, I, I'm not going to go that long. Um, everybody be falling asleep. Carbon tax, I don't know much about. Anybody know how much carbon is, is, is produced making a liter of oil? Does anybody know that? If you have my name here, email me if you find that. How much carbon is made with one liter of oil? The reason I ask that is um, a 318 CAT engine takes how many liters? Any idea? Your, your car takes what, five? Six liters of oil? Diesel engine takes a little bit more. Well, 40? 50 liters of oil on an oil change? Um, that's a lot of oil. You got uh, companies I work for, I won't mention, uh, like Sangel. I won't mention them. I, I, I worked right beside the pit where they would change oil. And in, in the springtime, they would change oil fluids on that coil tubing unit, the coolant, the hydraulic oil, the engine oil. And then every 250 hours, they would change the oil in the engine. Do I trust my OEMs? No. Who's, who's responsible for the maintenance? OK. Who's going to have to go and educate themselves to figure out how long the oil should be in there? Well, that's my job. It's my maintenance guy's job. So in a, in a given year, we're looking at somewhere around, what did I calculate it? 864 liters. I don't know, more than that. Sorry. 84,000 liters of oil in our twin pumps. And 
at $3.50, it's a lot of money. So what do we do at step? How do we think, we, do we run that truck over the pit uh, 250 hours? What do we do? How do we fix this? Monitor the oil. So we do the oil test, right? And two things come of that. We're actually less than 10% of the oil changes that we're supposed to have done on, on, on those engines. Less than 10%, we're down around 8.4%. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. The main, you can times it by three because that's what it's gonna cost you actually to get the oil out of there. Because of service truck, labor, recovery, facility, and all that. So when you add it up, it's a, it's a fair amount of money. The other part of that that comes out of that is the guys that are actually doing the sampling are maintenance people, not operations. And they know more about the engine than anybody else. They know when the, the predictive part of it when there's something going on. So just by doing all the samples changing, and, and, and changing oil on that, we, we save around a million dollars per 45 frac pumpers. That's a fair significant number. So when you're at competition is Calfrac and you're going head to head at a lease and they say, how much will it cost us to frack that well? We can take three, four, five points right off that and, and take, take that away. How did we become the biggest coil tubing company in, in Western Canada in six years by doing that type of technology? The other thing that happened is we don't change oil at lease. Don't need to. Where, where do we do it? At the shop. Um, the other part of that, we don't, we don't drain the oil, we suck it out. All of our oils and fluids are quick coupled. So you come up like NASCAR has, I don't know if you've ever seen NASCAR, cars overheat and they have two quick couplers underneath the hood and they'll come up and plug on two lines and they'll suck all the water out and cool it and change it in 30 seconds or less in a NASCAR. Something about time, they're really picky on time. We didn't, ours is a little bit smarter, right? Got a quick coupler on the side, plug in a, a little pump and it'll go dook, 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 and it's pumping a little chugger pump, put, pulling the oil out. Well, the maintenance guy is looking at other things and when it starts going really fast, you're, you're empty. So you couple it and you go buy a Parker Guardian pump from, uh, from CBVL down there and you plug it on, it's got a filter and you turn it on and you sit there with a dipstick and hold oh, 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 yeah, done. Take it off, wipe the quick coupler. What's the point of dumping it? I, I know of frack pumpers going out doing 14, 15 frack pumpers and the operations changing oil, they'll dump the oil into a pan, carry it and dump it in 20 liter pails and take it away. Now, they never spill it. And if you are going to spill, it's really good if you spill it during the winter time because you can't find it, right? <laughs> a little bit of snow on there, it's good. So our exposure to environmental risk is way down. Our clients love that. And when we actually do see something wrong with the oil, we actually, let's bring it back to the shop, right? And it's not code three, you're at 252 hours, you're going to go over and get that truck into, you know, Dave, you've been there, yeah, based on hours. Um, one little story was a, a, a Cat 318 engine came out of, there was two of them on a trailer and it had um, triggered coolant on, on, the, on the sample. So a little bit of coolant in the engine oil. That's okay, right? Cat tells me it is. Yeah. Serious. Oh yeah. They have a percentage. Don't go too high. Oh. So I wrote them a letter back. I said, please give me engines that don't have coolant in them because we don't have coolant in our engine oils. Give this to somebody who likes coolant in their engine adversarial. We went looking for it, they couldn't find it, and he said send it back to work. I, uh, I sent my operation manager, CC Cat, said please take this out to the field and run it until it falls apart. They didn't like that, adversarial again. Took it in, and a guy walked up to the unit and he goes, hose wrong. Seriously? Hose wrong. One little quarter inch line was in the wrong port. It was sucking coolant into the turbo of that engine. All we had to do is change, that's all we had to do. If we hadn't been sampling, and we hadn't taken the rules of no coolant, we would still have that engine, well, we're probably on the third or fourth engine now, right? And thusly, because we're repair technicians, we probably get really good at changing the engine, huh? Put it back in the same way it was. Oh yeah, yeah, we'd hose it the same way. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, again, um, on, on engine oil, I'm going for, uh, forever on engine oil. Any idea what um, soot in the engine oil? You've probably seen some of the commercials, see them on the side of the road, use Duron oil and they show a picture of a piston with soot on the side. It's on the highway too, on the way up. 
you gotta use their oil so you have less soot. Soot kills diesel engines. Anybody know what, how much soot is allowed in an engine? Cummins has a rule. It's 7.5% soot, it's allowable. Yeah, if you get 7.6, you should change the oil out. Serious. You know what our standard is? I can't say zero because that's an impossibility. Well, in our, our world, yes. It's actually 0 0.3, 0.3%. How do we get there? Spinner filtration, which is a rotational centrifuge, and one eye filtration to get that down. And we consistently are below 0 0.2, always 0 0.2. We had an engine failure with a million kilometers on the engine. And the engine failure was a guy starting the start button without preheating the engine, and it split the liner. Really upsetting, especially when you have an engine with 20,000 hours on it, and you're going for 40,000 hours, and it splits the liner. We took that engine and had it replaced. Uh, Cummins, in this case, um, told us that we had to replace the engine because it was wore out. So I had, you, you were here with Bernie yesterday, he is my three-piece suit in traffic court, if you think of that for a while. This guy knows engines. And so I sent him there to go and, and analyze that engine, what failed. It turned out the piston ring was put on wrong on the top of the piston. That's what was wrong with it. It scored the cylinder, and then finally it broke years later. Cummins did their report. What did they say? They didn't identify the ring, I can tell you that. You know what they told me? Um, excessive oxidization because of extended oil changes. No facts, no facts, no, no, that's all it said on there. So anybody know what would wear out on an engine? What wears out, it will have lots of soot, any idea? Top end, cam, that's the thing, top end, right? It's got high pressure. So let's take that and measure that million kilometer engine. So I did that, I paid Cummins to take it out of the old core and I took it to a machine shop and I says, where the roller rolls, I want you to measure and where it doesn't touch, measure. Tell me what the difference is in thousandths of an inch or 10 thousandths of an inch. The difference on an engine that had 20,000 plus hours or a million kilometers, zero, zero. And that's, and, and, and we're looking at seven oil changes on an engine that has 20,000. When would Cat would like me to overhaul those engines? Or Cummins, both have the same rule on hours. Dave, you know? 10, 10,000 hours. So they were knocking on our door at 12,000 hours because they knew, they were watching. They wanted, they, we have engines for you, Dale. Oh, that's nice. What are you at now? I said 25,000. And my operations manager, who, who obviously really keys into the money thing, he said, we're going for 40,000. So leave. You know, oh, pay, pay for lunch first, then leave. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we we see that all the time. But anyway, any questions in regards to this silly ranting old guy up here? But with the mindset, any questions about this this technology that where where we we might be using it? So um, in in all of your equipment, uh, you've got a lot of different technologies and stuff. Uh, where's the biggest ROI? Which single say piece of equipment? It's good. It's going to be the, the, the long term of the engines for sure. Yeah, uh, our return on investment on, on the oil. Um, that, that, that gearbox, when we had the 12, we had 12 of them, we went back to order six more. And, and it's from Serva Group here in Calgary. I don't want to mention their name. Um, I, I kid you not, we're having the boardroom discussion and sign off on ordering those six. So we do that. Um, what was it, $12 million we bought these units. And Ray Backer, the head of the food chain there, looks across the head of food chain for step, which is Steve Glanville, and says smirkly, he says, when are you guys gonna buy some Eaton 1202 gearboxes? I have them on the shelf. He's pre-ordered them. They're sitting on his shelf waiting for us. We're the prime user for that, that pump assembly. And Steve looked at us and he says, never. And we still have them today. We have zero failures in those boxes, and I know my competition has been taking them out left, right, and center, because they're not made to take, come out. It's a three-day affair. Dale, yeah, would you mention uh, Step Energy was the first end user to start filtering the coolant on diesel engines? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, he asked about coolant filtration. Um, 
there's two, two fluids that will, will take us out in, into uh, 2020 that will kill us. There's no doubt about it. It's, it will kill our in industry. And those two fluids are diesel fuel and coolant. We have to filter them. we got to get them clean. And the reason for the coolant is that we have filters on there. They, those big engines come with filters. Some of the smaller ones don't, but, and uh, they'll have additive package in there. And um, I'm, I'm going to pick on Dave a little bit. He started with us, and, and I said, Dave, hey, let's go down and see Roger. And he said, I believe in the technology. I believe, absolutely do believe. You don't, you know, I don't have to see. I said, we're going to put some filtration in. He said, awesome. Put it in the coolant. And uh, so a frack pumper, what is it? It's a couple of hundred liters of coolant in that huge radi radiator. How much in there? Like two, three, four hundred? Huh? 300 liters of coolant in this engine. It's the same engine, uh, 2,500 horsepower engine. It's huge. Um, Dave sent me a picture, and it was OMG was the title. And he had the filter in his hand, and it was covered. And he says, two hours. That's all it was, was two hours. And it was on the sideline. It wasn't on the main line. It was on the sideline. And so Dave ended up in the same position that I ha was. And that was, yeah, I believe in the technology. Great. And then when you actually take it apart, you go, are you kidding me? Like, where's this been all my life? What, you, know, I, you know what I mean? There's that eureka moment. You go, ah, I've got to put it in more. I've got to put it in everything. Put it in my water system at home. Like, Frank, I'm serious. Put it in your water system at home. You know, so that was, a, right? So we, we, we do that all the time. So we would have guys that would hit, um, say, about four years of an engine running, and, and one of the things that goes out is the water pump. So water pump goes out. Great, we carry water pumps. Why does the water pump quit? It's just a normal thing, Dale. You're just going to change water pumps out. That's, that's life. No, it's not. Water pumps go out because the bearing fails. The bearing fails, causes the seal to leak, so we change the water pump out. Or the rad cap quits. There's, those two go together. Um, so we're going to change the water pump out. What happens if you don't have the bearing fail? How long should that bearing go? Longer than the engine, I'm thinking. Because it will. It will. So when we start filtering it, we have that. When scooping them off, you got huge amounts of, of uh, contaminants in there. And I'm, we're still having our debate. We're, st we're, we're, we're doing some R&D around uh, how much can, can come out, how much we can actually get out, and, and what is it. And we consistently see non-metallic on the reports. And we'll send it in for a patch test and SEMS, and we'll get non-metallic in there. Well, how is it stuck on the magnet? Um, a couple I know we're off heart is 15%. I, I know that for a fact. R Roger's going to tell you it's higher, um, and he's, he's seen some more evidence uh, up in the 40s, um, but uh, consistently 15 plus percent. Yep, a coolant, engine oil, doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter where I pull it out. We've had one we pulled out and actually had plastic stuck on it. Last I checked, plastic's not a, but whether it was entrainment, entrapment, static uh, binding, there's more going on than we know. All I know is I can utilize that device, that product, that innovation to, to achieve result that put money in my pocket. That's basically what it comes down to. The um, engine fuel systems that are coming out, the tier four and tier five, you guys aren't aware of it, but th this is bizarre stuff. The, in, the injector pressure at the end of the nozzle is 60,000 PSI. Don't put your fingers under there. It will hurt for a second and then the finger will be on the ground. We cut steel at about 30,000 PSI on a water jet. So how clean does that fuel have to be? Amazingly clean. Cleaner than the blood that you're going to have a transfusion on. How are we going to get there? Well, part of the technology has to be there. Right? So that's why I say that when it's going to take us out, that, that will take us out. You know, we can't afford putting injectors in. We can't afford to have the emissions go above the value of that engine. It'll shut us down. The computer shuts us down automatically. So, Dale, you mentioned what the cost or like what the amount of CO2 was to produce a barrel of oil. I looked up some quick numbers. Uh, burning fuel, it's 16 or 19.6 pounds of CO2 to burn a gallon of gas, and it's 22.4 pounds of CO2 to burn a gallon of diesel. Right. So, it's a significant amount. Absolutely. Um, what I'm looking for um, is not how much carbon is going to be um, emitted. I want to know how much it takes to make this, right? Because you're only down to 1%, I think, of the barrel goes actually into engine oil. I think that's what it is, right? And so, because guess what I want to do? 
I want it in our paperwork, and, our, and I want to go back to government. We, our CEO now is in grouping with other CEOs here in Calgary, and their main focus is to lobby government and the public to prove that the industry we're in is clean. And we're doing everything that we can to be clean, right? And to have, say, our footprint for engine oil usage is not here, it's 10% of that. Yeah, I want people to know that, right? I want, I want, I want that exposed for sure. So yeah, it's how much carbon is to, to make that. Any other questions about this product? I probably missed a lot of good stuff. You mentioned that you were also in uh, Step Energy in Texas and Louisiana. Yes. Uh, where are you located now? We're in San Antonio, uh, outside in Floresville. We're in Midland. Ha uh, Haynesville, isn't it? Somewhere's out there. You can go on our website. And we'll, um, yeah, Lafayette, uh, over there. They just opened a new base there. And like I say, they're going so fast that I don't even remember. They're going to be bigger in, in the United States than we will be in Canada. Right today, we have 12 coil spreads um, running throughout Canada. We have 20 spreads complete. We'll see a lot more in the States going down there for sure. Yeah, yeah. Dale, a little bit different than what you're talking about right now, but in regards to when you hire new millwrights or mm -hmm. new heavy duty mechanics, do they come with a different attitude? Do they actually come with an attitude of, let's make this last longer or let's look at new technology or is it just still the kind of the cookie cutter? I wish we, I could say we hired lots. We don't. Our turnover is very, very low. Um, in fact, it's zero. Um, the guys that we hire in our interview process, the things we ask for is their hunger for knowledge and to be better. That's the guy I want. Again, if it's cookie cutter, over time, no, I don't want you. I want the guy to start talking predictive maintenance. I want him to talk an oil sample, that kind of thing. Even if they don't know about it, uh, as, as, uh, as a, a knowledge to say, I can read this report, um, but I want to. That's, where I, that's the guy we'll hire, we'll go that direction. So the, the struggles, for sure, are, are there for that, that knowledge. But we had um, one guy quit on us. And he came from Trican, I won't mention that. And he worked with us about nine months. And he said, I, 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 can't, I can't handle this. I don't get the equipment long enough, and I don't have all the tools I need. He did come from Trican, where they had lots of equipment and lots of tools. Right? And we're talking specialty tools. So he went over to another company that's green and white and called Calfrac. And he went to work there. And, uh, I, as I way out the door, I says, you drank from the fire hose. It's not going to be the same. So he gets over there. Guess what he's doing? Oil changes. And he kind of says, hey, uh, you don't have to do this. I was at step. You don't have to do this. What did he do at that point? What did Calfrac do? Any idea? Shut up. Shut up. Exactly that. You were told, go out and change the oil. That's what you're here to do. Get it done. And that's... He, he's back with us. He, he picked up the phone. He was there for, well, he was there for about six months because he couldn't get back into step. Right? And then I, so when he came back, I went, I went right up to him. I says, how was that little experiment? He said, I am totally embarrassed. I, and he said, I didn't want to see you. And, you know, the confrontation. I said, no, no, no. I, I, I said, you, what you, teach me what, what went on there. And he said, I knew how to do it right. So when you, you're in this environment, when you, when you start turning on the brain. You are a maintenance caregiver. Tell me what we need to do better. And you go back to them with, a, say, read this oil sample and I'll send those reports. I don't know how to read it. Read it. Try to understand it. If you need some literature, I'll send it to you. Do you need a course? We'll, we'll call Bernie in and do the course. Right? And as soon as you start doing that, they turn on. Right? Anybody can change oil. Anybody can change oil. Not anybody can read a sample and do it right. Daphne, you had a question. Uh, so we talked about this before, but we're, how do you think we, we're going to be able to change that mindset of these companies, even though they have people who are saying, let's do it better, if there's just so much pushback to it? So what do you, where do you think that? Obviously, the question is, how, how, do we, how, do we, how do we change that? There's two motivators, really, and that's sex and money. Absolutely motivators. And right now, the oil field is stopped buying too many of the other ones, and they're losing money. They're losing money hand over fist. When we went head to head and we released our, our, our numbers before we were, when we were private, and those guys, those CEOs read those, there's changes. Some of those big companies will not. 
they will, they will dissolve. There's no doubt in my mind. They'll, the people that are in this room, that's the ones you, that need to move up the chain, start the companies, and push the mindset. I have such a problem changing upper management. Even for the Mike Burbles of the world that came into our frack department, great guy, knows how to frack well, um, and now we have a reliability specialist over there, they don't really know what they got. Right, that mindset, yeah, I kind of want to do this, but I don't know how. The truth of it is, just let your dog off the chain and let him do what he has to do, right? And let him, let him go, give him a grant of authority. So the mindset's going to come from money in the bottom line, absolutely. Even for our own executive, uh, we have had people that are part of the boards on other companies and, and said Steps' name is used a lot, either on the execution, on regards to how do we work at a, at a well site, professionally, how we change the names of all, everybody to recognize who they are in the position of this company, and to say maintenance professionals and start training them as that, and to change the bottom line. So money's the motivator, and the people in this room and the people that aspire to that are the ones that we need to get into those companies. So do you think that's the executives then, and then the maintenance people, is it, and then not the people in the middle? Is that kind of what you're saying, is we have to go to the very top, or? Where is safety driven from? Roger, in your company, where's safety start? Right there. Right there. It's, I'll get you drop. Um, the, uh, probably coming close. Yeah, um, you know, I, had a, I worked for a, a company and the owner walked in to the shop and he didn't have a safety glass on. I said, you, you, need to, you need to put your safety glass on. He says, I own this damn company. I'll wear them if I want to. I quit. Done. See ya. What? Done. Because I cannot help the rest of these. Um, you know how I motivated my, uh, my CFO? Showed him that chart on oil changes. It turns out that we have, for our frack, frack spread that we have, you have one frack pumper parked against the fence that will never, ever move. He said, how do you figure that? I said, that's how much time it takes to change oil on all these. It's going to sit there. Oh, I said, by the way, you're going to take a maintenance caregiver and his wage is of 120 or 30 or $40,000 a year and you're going to wheel him over there and put him there too because he's never going to change, but, you know, the jobs. Then you're going to take a wheelbarrow with a million bucks in it and you're going to wheel it over there and it's all going to sit there nice and pretty over there. He said, no, we're not. No, we're not. Because we're when I started the company or started with the company, um, I wanted, Bernie was a big push. And I, I, I went past Bernie because he's preventative. I went because he was doing at Concord was oil changes by sample. And I said, Bernie, that's what I want to do. And I went and started doing reading. And my uh, COO says, I think you're crazy. He's an old fracker, old cementer. He said, you're crazy. You can't do that. I said, let me go. Let me do it. And now every April 1st, guess what I send out? We will be doing oil changes based on a 250-hour drop rate, and we're putting in oil pits in all the shops. And I sent it to everybody. And Steve, my CEO, would come back and says, nice try, Dale. It's not going to work April 1st, and it's not going to work ever. <laughs> and Because he, he's, he's a true believer in the bottom line, right? So it does have to happen at the top. Rob? You mentioned safety a few minutes ago. Yeah. Has anybody from your company yourself ever looked at the ROI the technology brings in regards to man hour safety, um, return on investment because of accidents? Um, yes, but not on, on, on directly related to the cost and maintenance. Um, we, have a, we have, our maintenance crew is definitely smaller than everybody else. In our duress driving, which I would love to actually calculate, we, it's really hard to capture some of those, those data points, but um, our duress drive is way, 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 way down. And our TRIF, total recordable industry frequency, anybody ever hear that number? Uh, we can't go to work unless our TRIF is down. We actually report to third party, so if you want us to come to your well, you're going to go to the third party and say, whether well, they're in your numbers. And for the longest time, it was zero. So the total recordable injury frequency is how many times you put somebody in the hospital they can't come to work for every 200,000 man hours worked. Our industry is about two, two and a half that we compete against. And for the longest time, and it still is today in the United States, our TRIF is zero. That includes maintenance. That includes maintenance. Until we decide to put a whole frack bus in the ditch, that it changed after that. Let, let it be known there. 
there, there are issues, of course. But in maintenance, maintenance TRIF today is still zero at, at step. And then you can take that back to the technology, to the, to the environment, to the teaching? I can take it back to the, to the mindset, Rob. It's, it, it is the concept, the mindset. Can you imagine if you had a loop truck that you had to race out because five-year frack pumpers are going to exceed their 250 hour and he puts it in a ditch? In my side, we're not even driving there. We're not even going there, right? But there's other, there's other standards and, and designs I could, I could speak to in regards to reducing that risk as well. But I wish I could. I uh, wish I had the analytics. And there's guys in this room, you, you, got, you try to capture that number. But anyway, Kim. Um, have you paid attention to, I guess, what universities are teaching their maintenance technicians or colleges? Um, and is that changing right now? Um, like, are they going in with the wrong mindset and, and it's not changing? In the it's education? not changing. The only ones that will actually change will be um, maybe Olds College, private, um, and whatnot. That will change, maybe. Um, and because they want to have, um, uh, offer more courses to gain more money, right? The, the offerings, that's the only way. It's not going to be mandated by the government. It's not going to, unless it's carbon tax, and maybe this, you know, there'll be, some of that will, uh, will come from this extended oil chain. Can you imagine in Alberta, if the Alberta government said, Every tractor on the road today is going to go to oil condition monitoring changes. Can you imagine that? That would change. We wouldn't have a carbon tax day. Guaranteed. We wouldn't. I forget it's 1.7 trillion liters of oil used that we could recycle. Why don't we just not use it? Well, who, who, who's going to say we do this? It's just like the sugar industry or the tobacco industry, right? Who's actually pulling the strings? So if that's say you wouldn't have any, or I guess you wouldn't have them hire professors that would be speaking strictly on oil analysis or on preventative maintenance and understanding that you have to re-educate everybody after they come out? Yes, correct. You can get certified reliability engineer certification. You can get society and maintenance reliability professional certification, and it's all plant-based. And not, I'm not saying I'm a vegetarian. It's all plant-based because it's... It's um, Pfizer, that, that, that uh, cancer drug that your mom had to take. You want to know that it's exactly correct, every pill. Well, they have reliability specialists that do that. Or the, the potash or the pulp mill, they'll have reliability specialists. We have more equipment running up and down our highways than all the plants put together in Canada. Is there reliability mobile? No. We have heavy-duty mechanics. We have gas mechanics. You know, mill rights. So, no. Will be someday. This will catch on. There's no doubt in my mind, because you will not be able to compete against this, or companies that take this mindset on. You won't. To, to embrace this type of technology, you know how I actually approach this. I don't go to our, our maintenance guys. Say, you will put a Y strainer on the fuel lines of old trucks. I don't do that. You know what I do? Come here. Let me show you the. Let me show you the technology. Roger, meet John. John, Roger, talk about technology, and. They come away and go, holy moly, i got to be putting this on my water tap at home. Right? So that's how, that's how we introduce that technology. Because really, all the people in this room, if I, if I brought another bunch of people in the maintenance end of it, there would be more applications for this every minute. Every minute. We can find new, new places to put it on all the time. So th those companies that are actually embracing that will be the ones that are profitable. Can't compete. you got to go to this, 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 this mindset. Any other questions? Did I suffice? What do you call people that don't believe in it? Um, don't believe it. <laughs> 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 that can go on the video? or? <laughs> um, it goes back. Uh, okay. It's a lot, without a long story. I, I did the Canadian Death Race. It's 125 kilometers. And when I finished it, I said I'm going to put a tattoo right there. It's going to say choice. Because the last eight inches is my choice. Whether it goes into my arm or my face, it's my choice. I'm the owner operator. And the only way I'm going to be able to make a good choice is to educate myself. Or I can just do what I did when I was 18. Walked into Safeway, leaving the hobby farm behind because dad kicked me out. Walk into Safeway and say, everything on these shelves is here for my nutritional benefit and the Canadian government has my back. You guys, no, that's not true. It's not there for my nutritional benefit. What? You know what I mean? It's ignorance. I'm okay with ignorance as bliss because they get paid overtime. So those guys will always stay there, right? They live in that world. They're okay with that. There's other ones such as myself say, once you come over this side, I can't go back, right? So 
educating themselves. So I'm, I'm not going to say they're silly, they're stupid, they're retarded or whatever, but they, there's, a, there's a place and time for them, right? They want, there's, a, there's an environment. I've actually released one guy. I said, you need to leave because you can't work in this environment. He said, I can't. <laughs> no, because he, he was a re replaced guy. He had the fastest air gun in the, in the shop, right? I'd rather you never came out of your box. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anyway, any other questions? Okay. I'm, I'm just I'm just going to go out of here today and 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 tweet hashtag mindset. There you go. We'll see what com what comes out of that for sure. For sure, mindset. It, it starts there, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time.